morning, everyone, and welcome to the Braden City Council meeting on Wednesday, June 9th at 8.30 a.m. I'm Mayor Gene Brown, and at this time we'll welcome Reverend Dr. Robert Baker from Christ Episcopal Church. Please stand. Good morning, and thank you, all of you, for your hard work uh, in serving the citizens of our city. Let us pray. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, send down upon those who hold office in the city of Bradenton the spirit of wisdom, charity, and justice, that with steadfast purpose they may faithfully serve in their offices to promote the well-being of all people through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Please join us in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, and we'll call the meeting to order. Mrs. Bochamp. Good morning. We have three proclamations this morning that I'll be reading on the mayor's behalf. By virtue of the authority vested in me as mayor of the city of Bradenton, I do hereby issue this proclamation honoring Sanitation Workers Day, June 17, 2021, and Waste Re and Recycling Workers Week, June 14 through 20th, 2021. Whereas the city of Bradenton values and celebrates our solid waste workers, including trash, yard waste, recyclable collectors, and drivers, as well as all others employed in the sanitation industry that diligently serve our residents and local businesses. And whereas according to the Center for Disease Control, the eradication of many diseases in the Western world is due in large part to higher public sanitation standards resulting from effective garbage disposal. And whereas the proper collection and disposal of waste and recyclables is vital to preventing disease, litter, and dump heaps. And whereas refuse haulers contribute to a tidy and clean community. And whereas the men and women employed by the City of Bradenton Public Works and Utilities Department, Solid Waste Division, are considered essential workers and make significant contributions to the safety, health, and welfare of our citizens and visitors. Now, therefore, be it resolved that I, Jean Brown, as mayor of the city of Bradenton, Florida, do hereby proclaim June 17, 2021 as Sanitation Workers Day and June 14 through 20, 2021 as Waste and Recycling Workers Week and encourage all citizens and local businesses to participate in opportunities to thank the men and women in the sanitation industry. Signed, Jean Brown, Mayor. Thank you. Who do we have here to accept this? Come forward, please. <laughs> Thank you. Who wants to be the spokesperson? Um, my name is Brian Cho. I'm the superintendent for solid waste. And thank you very much for this proclamation. We greatly appreciate it. And uh, we appreciate you honoring the hardworking uh, employees in our staff. Thank All you. Right. Any comments? I'm, I'm going to say just a couple things. Obviously, we know and, and uh, um, very few times do I get a calls about a lot of things, but if your garbage isn't picked up or something doesn't happen, we get the phone call. And as we've told people in the past, sometimes it's our fault, sometimes it's their fault if they miss the, the truck coming by or something, but, but people know our garbage collection, people more than they know others in the city, and we appreciate what you do, and it's greatly appreciated because it's missed when something happens. <laughs> um, that if your garbage doesn't get picked up. But thank you for what you do. And I know Mrs. Barnaby, I think, did you have a comment? Absolutely. Um, I remember the year that we had four hurricanes and four weekends. And I believe that there were ladies and gentlemen that worked 21 days straight to get our streets cleared, to get the, the, uh, a lot of the storm stuff taken care of, even though we have a state contract that has people coming and they're supposed to do that. Face it, the city of Brandon is a small fish in that big pond. And it was because of, of you all that we were able to get our city back up and running. 
Um, you've heard me say it before, you may never call for a fireman, you may never call for a police officer, but every time I go out into the neighborhoods, they always tell me about you ladies and gentlemen, how much they appreciate your hard work. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone, and please pass that along. <laughs> Mrs. Bochamp. Next, by virtue of the authority vested in me as mayor of the city of Bradenton, I do hereby issue this proclamation honoring Humane Society of Manatee County, 50th Anniversary Celebration Month, June 2021. Whereas the Humane Society of Manatee County was founded in 1971 by a group of volunteers dedicated to the humane treatment of animals. They were able to obtain their nonprofit 501c3 status in 1973 and have continued to work tirelessly to help all animals. And whereas the Humane Society recognizes the importance of community education and collaboration to help foster compassion and respect for animals. And whereas, since 2009, the Humane Alliance model spay and neuter clinic has performed 50,000 low-cost or free spay or neuter surgeries. And whereas the pet food pantry has distributed more than 10,000 pounds of pet food to financially challenged families each year. And whereas the Society's Second Chance Adoption Program rehomes more than 600 cats and dogs each year after providing medical care and behavioral support. And whereas the Humane Society of Manatee County stands firm in their commitment to animals through expanding their campus and services to increase the demand of our community. Now, therefore, be it resolved that I, Jean Brown, as mayor of the city of Bradenton, Florida, do hereby proclaim the month of June 2021 as Humane Society of Manatee County 50th Anniversary Celebration Month in Bradenton and urge all citizens to support them in their quest to help all animals find their forever home. Signed, Jean Brown, Mayor. Thank you, Ms. Bochep. Who do we have to accept this award? Proclamation. Vicki, come up also. Come on, Vicki. Thank you. Vicki, come up, so. <laughs> Vicki needs to come up also, so. So I think I can do this without the microphone, okay. Mayor. Okay. I want to thank you, yeah. members of your administration, the council members and the city of Bradenton. Um, compassion, commitment, and community has got us to our 50th anniversary. And um, this community, including everyone here, has been remarkably supportive. Um, most recently, we had an issue with our fire alarm. And within less than an hour, I had a fire inspector standing in our building helping me work through that. Uh, we have some very interesting visitors stop by our facility, our campus, and Chief Bevan, Detective Moyette, and all the members of the police department of the city of Bradenton have been absolutely amazing helping keep our facility and my staff and volunteers safe. So on behalf of our board of directors, our board president, David Smith, my staff, Valerie Bless, development director, Vicki Siddons, human resources and office manager, and on behalf of all of our staff and volunteers, we appreciate this very much, and we also appreciate the guidance and guiding hand of the city of Bradenton as we do what we do. So thank you all so much. Thank you, and um, just real quick, anybody want to say anything? All right, um, I was fortunate enough to get invited to an event that you all had, and uh, one of the things that, that uh, really sticks out, and especially through this pandemic time we've had over the last year and a half, um, is, is what you did to help people, because a lot of the people in our community and around this country only had their animals, and for you to be there to, to stay strong through that was great to see, and we're lucky to have you in the city of Bradenton, so we appreciate what you do and keep up the great work, so thank you.
Yeah, everybody get in the picture, Valerie and Vicki, and then she'll send it to you. I'm making you do it. So. I knew it. By order of the mayor. Everybody like right. alphabetically right. by height. Right, yeah. Oh, did we, we just did that, didn't we? Wow. Thank you. Great job. Have a great job. day. Appreciate it. Good to see you guys. Bye. All right, Mrs. Bochamp. And finally, by virtue of the authority vested in me as mayor of the city of Bradenton, I do hereby issue this proclamation honoring National Garden Week, June 16th through 12th, or 6th through 12th, excuse me, 2021. Whereas gardeners have a passion for nurturing the beauty and resources of the earth through the planting of seeds, the care of plants, and the riches of their efforts. And whereas gardeners seek to add beauty, splendor, fragrance, and nutrition to our lives through the growing of herbs, vegetables, foliage, and flowers. And whereas gardeners work to preserve our country's traditional spirit of independence and initiative through innovation and hard work. And whereas gardeners advocate the importance of all creatures, large and small, that share our world and their roles in a balanced and productive ecology. And whereas gardening furnishes a challenging and productive activity for our citizens, for those just learning as well as those having years of experience. And whereas gardening promotes a healthy lifestyle that lasts a lifetime, helps reduce stress in the other areas of our life, teaches that rewards can come from diligent efforts. And whereas gardening enables members of the garden clubs across the nation and the world to make a world of difference in the communities where they reside and work. Now therefore be it resolved that I, Jean Brown, as mayor of the city of Bradenton, Florida, do hereby proclaim June 6th through 12th, 2021 as National Garden Week in Bradenton and acknowledge the importance of gardening and the numerous contributions of gardeners. Signed, Jean Brown, Mayor. Thank you. Who do we have? Marcia. <laughs> Marcia, Marcia. Bring everybody up. Yeah. And welcome back, Bev. Thank you. <laughs> Lots of new faces here. Yeah. Um, it was very interesting. Come, come up to the podium oh, there so we can make sure you're on the TV. It was very interesting to hear you talk about how the pets sustained us through the pandemic. Well, what we have found is our gardens mm -hmm. have sustained us. Um, the people have turned to nature again. They are noticing the birds, the bees, the butterflies, the manatees, everything. And so we're just very proud that um, we've been a part of the community for over 90 years and we cherish our little corner of Lewis Park. We um, are using this week for us as a club to come together again. So we had a group there yesterday uh, making our grounds beautiful. We're gonna have our first in-person group there uh, tomorrow, right, Marcia? Yeah, tomorrow. So thank you all. We appreciate you recognizing this as National Garden Week, and we love our relationship with the city. All right, good. Thank, thank you, you Ms. Barnaby. Congratulations, and thank you all for everything that you do. And I don't think people realize how much you actually do out in the community because you do it so gently and so quietly. Um, we in the past used to do a, a get the neighborhood together and do a cleanup of the whole park in the spring where it was a little cooler and people didn't suffer heat stroke. So if you would like to do that again next spring, please get with me and I'd love to, to participate with it. Great idea. Thank you, Mary Ann. Mr. Roth. Uh, thank you. Thank you for what you do. It's, it's uh, you know, really, really well kept property in the middle of a uh, in the middle of a, uh, a, a nice neighborhood. So I appreciate the way you, you, you look after your, uh, your property and the grounds. It's beautiful. And I remember um, I was invited by uh, Bev and our old friend Ruth to attend one of the luncheons. And I got to admit that at the time I was looking at the facility and all I could think about was my daughter's pending wedding. <laughs> and, and, uh, and I was like, do you by chance, uh, you know, rent this place? And, 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 and you, and, and, it, my wife, my daughter had a, a wonderful, wonderful, magical wedding there, and I want to thank you all for that opportunity. And, and we did pay for it, by the way. <laughs> there are lots of people around town that have memories of the events that they've had there at the Little yeah. Garden Club. So it's it's a very, very special place. We we had people traveling from all over the globe, New Ze and including New Zealand. Oh, wonderful! That yeah. That's cool. And you even had a, a yes. vice mayor show up dressed as. Uh, Mother Nature for a state oh, proclamation. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Manatee River Garden Club is, and, and I will also, you all realize that, um, you know, we're members of the 
Florida Federation of Garden Clubs and National Garden Clubs. And our garden club is, is actually one of the top in, in the nation. Um, I'm on the, actually on the national board and I see a lot of other garden clubs and states and um, we make you all proud, I promise. Yeah. Well, we do it, and uh, obviously living in, in that neighborhood right down 32nd Street for 30 years before we moved a few years uh -huh. ago, you know, we spent a lot of time at Lewis Park with our kids growing up, as I know all of us up here spent time and, and being the councilman for Ward 2 for all those years. But um, we appreciate what you do. We know you're volunteers, mm -hmm. and we all volunteer at things, and we know it takes time and effort. And through this pandemic, it's been a lot more challenging, but we appreciate what you've done. and. And I know one of our goals, obviously, is keeping that area, as well as Lewis Park, a very proud park for our, our neighborhoods and our city. Job. So I thank you for what you do. I had my granddaughter there yeah. yesterday. Yeah. Good. <laughs> well, we appreciate it. Thank, thank you. you. Oh, and turn around and get a picture. Picture. <laughs> you got the picture. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. Mrs. Bochamp. We have two presentations this morning. We'll start with the Life Saving Award presented to Mr. Austin Cannon and Officer Jonathan Thin. Good morning, everyone. Um, this is a, a unique honor for me to, uh, to do today. A couple of you all were at our awards ceremony yesterday. Uh, this was a little different because we had the opportunity for the first time since I've been here in five years to honor one of our citizens in the community. Um, I'm going to read so that I don't miss anything because I think it was written well and it, it's pretty compelling. On January 7th, 2021, Officer Jonathan Thin was returning from Sarasota after having his vehicle serviced. While en route back to the city of Brainton, he was flagged down by an unknown male advising him of an unconscious female lying on her back on the sidewalk in the 3100 block of Tamiami Trail. Officer Thin made contact with the unconscious female who was not breathing and her face and arms were dark blue. Officer Thin immediately began CPR compressions for a few minutes, however, the female remained unresponsive. At this time, Mr. Austin Cannon joined in. Who, and he uh, continued to assist Officer Thin with chest compressions. Uh, it allowed Officer Thin to go retrieve his issued resuscitator face mask, at which time he and Mr. Cannon took turns conducting chest compressions and blowing into the air mask. I've done that, and I can tell you how utterly exhausting it can be to have to do that and, and understand what's at stake. Um, minutes seem to be 10 minutes. Um, they continued to do it until, remarkably, the female regained consciousness, got up, and started to walk away. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, ultimately, they were able to stop her. EMS came. I think she relapsed a little bit, and uh, they took her away. Um, she wound up getting released from the hospital and had an opportunity to live life um, one more time. And so... Uh, it, it took us a little while to figure out and find Mr. Cannon, but we all have our ways, you know that, at the police department. And initially, we were going to simply honor our officer with a life-saving award. And I see he's already got one. You can only wear one of these, by the way, okay? okay? You can hold on to it and show it to everybody. You can't stack them up on your shirt. Um, uh, but that's notable that this is his second one. But we felt remiss that we weren't going to uh, take the opportunity to recognize one of our citizens for, for saving a life. And in this day and age, uh, people don't always jump in. They don't always enter the fray with the you know, litigious nature of our society. Um, it's easy for folks to drive on by, and we've all seen it, but not Mr. Cannon. And um, I'm not going to junior deputize you. I'm not going to do any of those things. <laughs> Um, you don't get a car or anything like that <laughs> or a key to my office. But what I am going to do is uh, present you with a life-saving award. It says, an appreciation and recognition of your quick actions which resulted in the preservation of a person's life on January 7th, 2021 from the Bradenton Police Department. So congratulations and thank you. Get a coin. That 
might be worth even more in this day and age. And I, I'm going to just say one more time, Officer Thin, that's remarkable. This is your second life saving award. Um, my folks are out there doing this each and every day. Um, what you all do for the citizens of this community is, is amazing. You save lives, you change lives, and, and thank you for that, and keep up the good work. Thank you, Chief. Okay. Thank Mr. You. Mayor. Mr. Cannon, I wanted to say yeah. something, but can you introduce who's here with you today? Yes. Mr. Yes. Cannon. So. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, first of all, it's an honor being here. Um, I have my mom, my dad, <laughs> uh, my fiance, Eden, um, my brother, and his wife, Maddie and Clay, and uh, just an honor. I uh, just graduated fire school and EMT, so um, maybe one day I'll, you know, be doing this <laughs> for a career, so. He's there, so. Police department. I know. <laughs> switch over, so. Geez. Yeah, so it's, it's a pleasure, it's an honor, and um, yeah. thanks for having us, so. Mrs. Yeah. Barnaby? I, I wanted to know who yeah. all the people yeah, were that were with you. Right. And to mom and dad, thank you for raising such a productive and caring citizen. We don't see it a lot, so thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, and great job, so both of you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir, Mr. Roth. Yeah, Mr. Cannon, there's an HR department right upstairs. <laughs> <laughs> Mrs. Bochamp. Our next presentation is by David Tomasco, PhD, the Executive Director of the Sarasota Bay Estuary Program, who will speak about the state of the bay. Kind of a hard act to follow there. Yes. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> Everyone left. Yeah. <laughs> I'm kind of used to it. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of the City Council. If I don't screw this up, oh, here we are. Perfect. So uh, to get going, um, this report card for the Sarasota Bay is uh, important, we think, to the residents, even though most of them left, but uh, because um, people enjoy Sarasota Bay in a different way than they do, like, say, Narragansett Bay and San Francisco Bay. So people actually get in the water here, and when they get in the water, these are photos from Sarasota County on the left and Manatee County on the right. This is Longboat Pass area. Um, and uh, when they get in the water, they kind of expect to be able to see their feet when they're in waist deep water, and they don't want to see like big strands of mackerel as you floating around and wrapping around their waist and stuff. And so the health of the bay is important to our quality of life here. Uh, I've been working and or playing in Sarasota Bay for 30 years, and this is what I do on weekends. This is what my family does on weekends. Uh, it's also important to our economy. It's not the only thing we have going on, but we have a, a tourism um, is a big part of our economy. And it's not just tourism. Um, a couple years ago, we did an economic study for Sarasota Bay. There's about 3,000 boats uh, registered in Manatee and Sarasota counties. People are out fishing, water skiing, playing around, doing stuff we just saw. Uh, but there's also things like property value uplift. Those of you who are in real estate know that people pay more to live on the water than across the street, and they pay more to live across the street than a couple of blocks or a couple of miles inland. And that uplift in property values is quantified around $3 billion which is a significant impact on like your property taxes. So the health of the bay stays there when the bay is an amenity, when it becomes an eyesore, when it starts to smell bad, when you have fish kills and it starts to reek, like it is right now on Sneed Island. If that becomes the, the norm, then that's not exactly something that you want to live next to. There's about 20,000 jobs associated with the bay, not just commercial fishermen in Cortez, but also recreational fishing guides, but also people who work in marinas, people who rent out boats, people who work as waiters and bartenders or who own waterfront restaurants, people in real estate who are selling waterfront property, and even uh, visitors. Visitors spend about $15 million on just you know being able to go fishing in Sarasota Bay. So how we manage the bay is we, we focus on nutrients, and nutrients, if you're not familiar with it, if you want your lawn to look green or if you want your orange tree to grow really rapidly, you add nutrients, nitrogen or phosphorus. If you want the bay to look green, add nitrogen and phosphorus, but you don't want it to look green. You want it to look that pretty blue color. If you want algae to grow, add nitrogen and phosphorus, but we don't. So we're about nutrient management. And this uh, cartoon is trying to show the, the gradient of 
low nutrients to high nutrients. On the far left-hand side is the water like the Tortugas, the Marquesas, you know, the better parts of the Florida Keys where, the, where you have 50, 100-foot visibility and corals. That's not what we're trying to get at. But on the far right-hand side is the Indian River Lagoon where we've got hundreds of dead and dying manatees starving to death because there's not enough food for them because there's no seagrass because the water clarity is bad because there's too much algae because there's too many nutrients. So we're trying to shoot for right down the middle, which is an optimal habitat relevant for this particular area. So we have a report card that we developed that is uh, pretty holistic, we think, and it's pretty realistic. We're not trying to get Sarasota Bay to look like it did in the 1800s. We're not even trying to get it to look like the 1950s because we don't know what it was like in the 1950s. We have no way of figuring it out exactly. We're trying to make it look like it looked like a decade ago because a decade ago it was a healthier system than it was than it is now. Um, and so we have these metrics that we can use. Uh, we look at the nutrient concentration, nitrogen concentration. We look at chlorophyll. Chlorophyll is a pigment that's found by anything that photosynthesizes, whether it's a sequoia tree or algae. And it measures how green the water is, how much algae is growing in the water. And we look at seagrass coverage. Seagrass is that kind of habitat that is important for fish and crabs and shrimp and water clarity, and it helps keep your shorelines in place. And then we also look at macroalgae, which is that kind of tumbleweed uh, looking stuff that can grow in, or sometimes it looks like uh, uh, one of the names for the stuff we have growing right now is mermaid hair. And it looks like a big pile of like green hair left in the bottom of a bathtub. It's just gross, and that's <laughs> measurable. And so we can measure all of these independently for each bay segment for each year. And we can say, well, what does it look like in the bay? Because I get asked all the time, what's the health of the bay? And it depends on where you are. And it depends on when you are, wherever you are as well. And so this report card is not regulatory. It has no permanent implications. It doesn't affect your wastewater treatment plant, which by the way is one of the better one treatment plants in the, in the uh, state of Florida. It doesn't affect your NPDES permit. Uh, but it's meant to be understandable by the public because we have impairments of water quality in lots of places, but hardly anyone knows about it because it's not, it's not widely disseminated. And so you can't act on a problem unless you understand it. And so we're trying to present information in a way that's understandable by the public, but also actionable, which means what are you supposed to do about it? What are you as policymakers, what is the public supposed to do about these sort of issues? And scientifically sound. We had a, a technical advisory committee that literally has centuries, it's just kind of scary, but centuries of experience working in Sarasota Bay, and we ran this by them before we did that. I'm responsible for about a third of a century, so. Um, so it includes everything in here but the fish. And if we can get the fish in here, we'll do that. But it's, it's a holistic indicator. It's not just chemistry, but it's everything that helps make Sarasota Bay the productive system that it is. So, what do you do with your scores? This is like bowling, not golf. A high score is good. And, and the way you get the highest score is if things are as good in your bay in any given year as they were during that reference period. And the way you get the lowest score is if in your bay in that particular year, things were worse than the worst year in the reference period for each of those four metrics. And then we take the average of them. And the idea is if you're in that top score, you're looking pretty good. You probably don't need to do a whole lot more except just monitor it to make sure it doesn't change. If you're in that bottom category, you probably have to do something because if you don't do something about it, you have the potential to become the next Indian River Lagoon. And that is not where you want to be because that is, if you're familiar with it, go back there now. It is not the same system. It is, it's, it's potentially unretrievable, uh, it's system health. So they're color coded in the category. So just keep in mind, blues as in like the offshore Gulf of Mexico, uh, you know, blue is good, green is good, keep going. Red is like, stop, stop what you're doing. And so the blues and greens are kind of like indicating the higher scores, the better outcomes, and the yellows would mean caution, the reds means stop, figure out what's going on. So what does it look like? Well, we broke this down for each of the bay segments. Palmasola Bay, I guess you guys know where Palmasola Bay is, but I'm giving this presentation a lot of places where they don't. But the upper part of the bay is pretty extensive from basically Anna Maria Sound area all the way down to Siesta Key Drive. And then the lower three systems, Roberts Bay, Little Sarasota Bay, Blackburn Bay, south of Siesta Key Drive. So how's it doing? It depends on where you are. So let's first off look at the top years, 2006 to 2012. Across all those bays, we were doing pretty good. Lots of blues, lots of greens. We were doing well. This is a healthy system back then. We had a, a Blackburn Bay in 2010 had a dip into the yellow range, but pretty good. Um, now, the more recent time period depends on where you are. Palmasola Bay, 
still doing pretty good. Palmasola Bay, by the metrics we have, the nutrient content, the chlorophyll content, the seagrasses, um, it's doing fairly well. It's the, probably the healthiest system we have in the Sarasota Bay system. The upper part of the bay was doing good until 2018. 2018 was the second of two red tides. That red tide event in 2018 hit that system real hard. And if you're familiar with it, if you spend time on the bay, this is not a surprise to you. This is not necessarily due to humans, but we're really careful about our language. Humans don't cause red tide, but we can cause it to be worse. We can make it more intense. We can make it hang around longer. We can spread it out over larger areas. And that's what we think happened in 2018 in the upper part of the bay. And that had a big impact on the health of our system. And that's something we have to recover from. The lower part of the bay, which is far away from you guys, has had a problem that can't be blamed on red tide. It preceded that. They're basically, they, they have not done as good of a job with their wastewater treatment plants as you guys have, and that's the fault that they've had. So 2018 red tide made them red across the board. So that part of the bay is humans and nature combining together. Um, but you don't have that in your system, but that is the reality down in that area. So we use seagrass as an indicator of the health of our bay. Maybe you've heard about it in Tampa Bay. They used it in Chesapeake Bay, Biscayne Bay, Indian River Lagoon, Denmark. Um, we're down 22% from our peak. Our peak was in 2016. So our bay was at its healthiest in around 2016 in terms of seagrass coverage. And, and where that loss occurred was earlier it occurred in the lower part of the bay. In the lower part of the bay from 88 to 2014, we had a 30% increase in seagrass coverage. That's gone. We're back to where we were 30 years ago in the lower part of the bay. The good news is it might be stabilized and we might be actually on the way to recovery because a lot of good things are happening now. But the more recent declines are occurring in the upper part of the bay, kind of in your backyard. And that's what this graphic shows. The area in red is the seagrass losses. And you'll see the big area in red that's located around Long Bar Point to the north and to the south. Halfway between Sister Keys and Long Bar Point was the epicenter, but it's also occurring. It's in the deeper water areas, which is the areas that would be most affected by something that reduces water clarity, such as that red tide. If you're familiar with that area, it's like the sea trout spawning ground. So the recreational fishing guides in Sarasota uh, argued to the Florida Fish and Wildlife Commission, and I don't think it was unanimous, to keep the catch and release only for uh, sea trout in that area because they know that even though it's going to it's going to upset about half of their customers, they know that it's not sustainable to be able to keep uh, um, sea trout, for example, when there's that big of an impact to their habitat. This area has changed dramatically. If you're not familiar with it. It's very different than it used to be. Um, so this report card kind of represents, we think, a, a way for the public and, and policymakers to understand what's going on. I was going to end it with this right here, except for Piney Point. And so the question about Piney Point, and yeah, well, the graphics are working. So uh, this is a, a representation of the hydrodynamic model of uh, the Piney Point spills from the University of South Florida. And you'll notice that. Uh, this area of green comes down into Terracia Bay and Manatee River and uh, a little bit maybe into Palmasol Bay and to Anna Maria Sound. This is a color-coded uh, system and the light colors that we see here represent a 1,000-fold dilution of what came out of Piney Point, which sounds awesome, a thousand-fold, but what came out of Piney Point is about 80 times more concentrated than what comes out of your wastewater treatment plant, okay? It is about a mm, hundred times more concentrated than urban stormwater runoff. It is 230 milligrams per liter. And you talk to people who know wastewater, it's just astonishing. It wasn't a phosphate gypsum. It was a fertilizer production plant wastewater reservoir. And 200 million gallons of it came out. And it was the load that would be experienced in Lower Bay in a year came out in 10 days. We don't know exactly what happened to it, but what we think is happening to uh, parts of Anna Maria Sound is potentially related to Piney Point. And so uh, I added this last section based on work that we've been doing recently. So I don't know if this comes out all that well. Uh, it does pretty good on those screens. This is uh, Lingbia, L-Y-N-G-B-Y-A. It's actually not its scientific name anymore, but people call it that, so we're gonna call it that. This is one of our seagrass transects, and this is so the pleasant part of my job is we actually dive down into the water to measure the health of the brain here, <laughs> which is okay. I've had all the kids I need. 
And so, <laughs> the area in the, sorry about that. The area in the white is the, the marker that shows the, the landward side of our transect. And uh, beyond that, that's not a mud flat, that's that lingbia. It extends out for like yards. And, and uh, so you see this mixture, the water looks kind of gross and green and everything like that. And uh, the right hand side is a, a close up of it where the water looks kind of silvery gray. That's not algae, that's bacteria. That's bacteria decomposing this stuff. And when it turns that kind of color, what that means is that it's used up all the oxygen in the water. And if you're a big fish, it's no big deal. You just swim away from it. But if you're a small fish, if you're a starfish, if you're a worm or a clam or something that lives on the bottom, it's a death sentence. You're not gonna be able to make it. And it's happening all along the shoreline. We have no oxygen. When you smell that rotten egg odor, that means no oxygen because that's only produced in the absence of oxygen. So our near shore areas where this stuff is accumulating, when you smell that stench that's kind of visible in a lot of places or noticeable, that's due to that. The problem is it's not going to end anytime soon because that stuff is being formed on the bottom of the bay. Anna Maria Sound from the bottom up to the surface is filled with this algae and it grows up and then it breaks loose and then it gets drifted wherever the wind is. But what you see on the surface is, is the, the dead and decaying material, not the living material. The living material is on the bottom of the bay. You can see the little circles there, that's oxygen bubbles. And that's what lifts it up to the surface and then blows it away. So what you're seeing right now is not the end of it. What you're seeing is the manifestation of the end stages of this algal bloom and there's more to come. It's like swimming three dimensionally through this. So it's not a good place. It's not a good condition we have right now. We can't say it definitively came from Piney Point, but um, Piney Point most certainly had some role in what we're seeing in this part of the bay. What we thought was going to happen in Tampa Bay, uh, we believe is probably happening in Sarasota Bay instead. And uh, it's affecting more than just the ecology of the bay. These are pictures that are taken. Uh, one of them, uh, the, the marina site is the, the Margaritaville Marina. I don't know its official name, but it's that marina there. And the other one is on Holmes Beach. So it's already affecting businesses. Uh, people who rent out boats are basically saying people come and they're just, uh -uh, I'm not going to take my kids out in this kind of water. And it's definitely affecting uh, in some of the areas next to the waterfront. People are not even staying in their houses anymore because it smells so bad. If you want a, a sense of it, go on 10th Street through Palmetto to Sneed Island and then turn left when you, as if you're going to Sneed Island Boat Works. And then that area right through there is just phenomenal. From a block away, you can smell the waterfront. So. And uh, that's it, if you have any questions or comments. <laughs> Mr. Well, Sanders. Well, what's the long-term effects then? Yeah, so mm, uh, we don't really know. Um, however, we've had lingbia blooms before. This stuff's been around for billions of years and, and it'll be here long after we're gone. But uh, short-term, uh, it's going to be a rough couple of weeks to months and we don't know if it's going to get worse with the rainy season or get better with the rainy season. You can, there's reasons to believe either way. Um, but we're down about 2,000 acres of seagrass already in the upper part of the bay and this is causing us further losses. The problem with when you get into that is ecosystems follow positive feedback loops and that can be in a positive direction or a negative direction. So once you lose, for example, seagrass meadows, all the nitrogen and the phosphorus that was in that seagrass now becomes available for something else, like algae. And we probably have about 70 tons of uh, nitrogen from dead seagrass from the red tide. Now we're going to have more. Um, the fish kills that we're seeing with red tide aren't visible with this because the fish that it's killing live on the bottom. But they're there. And uh, so we don't really know. But it's not going to be a fun couple of days to weeks to months for the bay. And can it recover? Yeah, it can recover, but we have to stop insulting the system. You guys are doing a really good job. You have a really good wastewater treatment plant. You've got pretty good uh, stormwater rules and regulations in place. We're doing a stormwater retrofit for a GT Bray Park, uh, which is going to be a really neat little project we're doing uh, to help reduce nutrient loads. But you're not alone. You, you're, you're bordered by Sarasota County, which didn't do a good job for wastewater for a long time, and now they are. And you're bordering Piney Point, and Piney Point probably was the biggest single insult that we had to Tampa Bay and Sarasota Bay in the 30 years I've been working in this area. I live on the Manatee River, and um, I think it was 2019, I'd never seen the Manatee River green. Yeah. Ever. And uh, that, that was shocking. And, and then the, 
the buildup around people's docks and so forth, complaining that, and I don't know what you do, but listen. Yeah, we think that probably was related to the red tide red impacts tide. of 2018 that manifested themselves later on. Did the wind just blow it in? or Exactly. And then so we think that that's recoverable because we have had red, we're, we're always going to have red tide. We, you know, we're, we're not going to stop it, but we can reduce how big it is by our human contribution to it. But that was the big challenge we thought was responding to the red tide. And we th- we, we have a, a strategy of figuring out exactly how to respond to it, what we need to do based on monitoring. This thing blew in on top of it. And so, yeah, we don't really know exactly what's going to happen with this. But we do think that whatever you do, keep track of it because um, this is potentially reimbursable under the Natural Resources um, DA. Mm. Some, uh, there's, there's a NRDA, um, uh, Damages Assessment, Natural Resources Damage Assessment. Um, Whoever is responsible for the mismanagement of this particular system, whatever costs you accrue are potentially recoverable under the NRDA system. So keep track of what you do, keep track of what others do, uh, because when people are held accountable for it, if it happens, uh, there's the potential for you to get reimbursed for the expenses you spent. Councilwoman Barnaby. Um, Thank you for being here today. Can you go back to the slide where you showed um, the big red dot of the big red mass in Sarasota, but I wanted to look, if you, if you go up to the top here, yeah. I'm assuming that's the Manatee, no. <coughs> yeah. I'm assuming that's the Manatee River. Yes. And so we are having some effects along there, as, as yeah. Councilman Sanders said. Um, is it of any benefit to remove that wasted algae out of the system, out and get it off of the shore and out of the water? Uh, the, some people would say no. I would say yeah, because you know, I mean, let's use like a, 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 a policing strategy. Uh, you, we arrest prostitutes, we arrest thieves every day. Yet we still have prostitution, we still have you know robbery. We're not going to solve that, but you're not going to solve your problem, but you can make it better. And so, uh, that I, I think the mechanism that might make sense is if we can help quantify what you're doing with that. So don't just send people out there. Measure what you're doing. You guys spend money all the time on stormwater retrofits for ponds, right? To meet your NPS permits. So the average stormwater pond removes about 100 pounds of nitrogen a year. If you cleaned all the lingia out of like uh, two acres of this, that's about 100 pounds as well. So I don't know if you can get credit for it, but you should get credit for it. And uh, you know, the state of Florida right now is probably in a place where you can make an argument that they wouldn't be willing to accept in the past because they have some culpability in what happened in Piney Point. They absolutely do. So what I would suggest is basically say, look, I'm gonna scoop some of this stuff out. Uh, I expect to get reimbursed by it. And I, I, DEP's on my board, so I can't say what they're gonna do, but I would make that argument, which is like, I'm doing things to clean up from a mess that you were part of managing. Okay. Um, I I would be interested in I'll probably get fired for this, but. (laughs) But you've had all the children you need, so yeah, exactly. you don't have to worry about feeding more mouths. Um, and while I have you here, in the past, um, the estuary program used to provide teacher grants. Do you all still do that, and do you want to put that information out so that it goes? We do. We just actually had our round of selection. but It's called the Bay Partners Grants, and we have a couple of projects in Bradenton, a bunch in Mantee County in general. And uh, we gave out $56,000 in grants uh, throughout our watershed for public education, uh, our budget is spent the, uh, to run our program. Uh, you guys help fund us. We get money from the Water Management District, EPA, county, cities, everything like that. And then we dispense it, uh, the, the money for running our program, but then also about a third of it for science, a third of it for restoration, things like GT Bray, and then a third of it for public education outreach. And so, yeah, absolutely. We, we have a program that we, uh, um, uh, we've just spent $56,000 on, I think, 20 different grants that we spent um, divvied out. Can you give us your website address, please? Yeah, it's, or just email me at dave at sarasotabay.org, and I'll make sure that you get the right people uh, to get you that information. Thank you. Mr. Roth. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I, uh, I served on uh, Sarasota Bay Estuary under the previous uh, oh, great. director. Mark, at, yeah. Yeah, at Mark, and, um, and also. Uh, all good. <laughs> <laughs> right, I know, I know. And uh, also um, Tam- as the representative of Tampa Bay Regional Planning Council. Oh, fantastic. Part of the, the Tampa Bay estuary, which most people don't realize we're actually 
in that estuary with the Manti River. Yeah. But but we're but we it's all the water all mixes as we've just said. Absolutely. Um, what I want to do is bring up something because I know red tide has been something that's been on our our radar for a long time, and you mentioned blue green algae on the other coast. Uh, several years ago, I attended a. Uh, a banquet for Keep Manti Beautiful, and there was a professor there from Gulf Coast University down in Fort Myers who had a theory, uh, and I want to see if you've heard of it, that, that uh, the, um, he tracked that the, uh, the, the, the blooms came up about a year or two later after a hurricane, and, it, and they, they tended to come out of the um, cross Florida barge system there from Lake Okeechobee to the, the Fort Myers Inlet. And that, um, and the theory was that, that when a hurricane's come, it saturates the center part of the state, which is all agriculture, and cow manure, and that it comes up a little bit later. Had you ever heard that or seen it? Because he made he made a pretty impressive argument that this could be what's where it's. Being. Yeah, it sounds like Bill Mitch, uh, and he's a really well-known scientist. Uh, he's. Uh, uh, the the best research that's come out is actually University of Florida researchers about last year and, and what they've known. We know red tide has been around. The conquistadors talked about it. We had a red tide locally in 47, 48 that was so big that everyone was blaming the Navy on it and uh, uh, ordnance disposal after World War II. And and really the the what they found the UF researchers is once red tide gets, red tide initiates way out in the Gulf of Mexico. It has more to do with Saharan dust than anything that we do locally. But once it gets into your nearshore waters, it's not going to turn its nose up at a nitrogen molecule if it came from runoff. And so the best data set is right off of the Caloosahatchee, where they found that once a tide was there, the magnitude of that tide, how big it was, how strong it was, uh, was positively correlated with the nitrogen load coming down the Caloosahatchee River. So. We don't cause it, we can cause it to be worse, is the right way to put it. Thank you. Mr. Sanders? Uh, on the other coast, I believe they have, I've been told anyway, that they have a system where they clean up this in areas. I don't know if they've got a machine, a boat, or whatever it is. And it was offered, so why don't we do that? And I said, do you know anything about that, or is that just a? Yeah, and, and in fact, I can, uh, I can through, uh, Apparently we have an email issue, but I, I meant to uh, send an email that's uh, I can it, I'll give you my card and I can get you an email uh, But there are mechanisms through the state of Florida where you can hire a contractor to collect this material DP has not said that they will reimburse you for it But it's a way to get someone under contract right away So you don't have to worry about the contracting mechanisms and the scope work is all spelled out Pinellas County has been using them as well uh, but I would say hold on to your receipts in, until July and make the case to DP that you expect to be reimbursed because I believe that they should find the money to help you out on this, in my, my, my opinion. Is it expensive? I have no idea, uh, but I do know one thing. Make sure that you pay people not only by the hour. I come from the private sector. Pay them not only by the hour, but by what they produce. If you pay someone to just go out there for eight hours, they're going to put their nets maybe not in the best spots. If you pay them per hour and then you give them a reward on top of it for biomass produced, you're going to get a lot more biomass produced. We're going to weigh the algae. Absolutely. And that's the way you get a nutrient credit for it if you want to turn it into your permit uh, mm -hmm. obligations. In other words, you can build a pond, get 100 pounds, or you can scoop up ten, two acres of this stuff and get the same amount. Council McCook. What do you do with it after you collect it? I think, you know, uh, hey, you know, um, fertilizer is a, is a good thing. Bring it to your landfill or, or you know, um, mulch it. Uh, it's it's going to be kind of actually, it's really high quality nitrogen, phosphorus, slow release fertilizer. Give it to the garden club, you know. <laughs> 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 or could we, could we mix it in with our sludge, mister? Or we're not doing sludge anymore or? Oh, I wish we weren't doing sludge. <laughs> no, our, our sludge is land applied. Um, so, I mean, if it, if. If it were, that would probably be the most logical place for it to go. Yeah, I believe Manti County, excuse me, Pinellas County actually has the best experience. So I can get in touch with, uh, uh, I can get in touch with uh, Councilwoman uh, Coker. She's our policy board representative, and I'll give her all the information that uh, we can get about that. Pinellas County has been doing this. And I think it's probably more of a conjunction where we do it with the county, because more of the land is in the county. So something to probably bring to them and try to 
work together on that. I, I thought it might be easier because I've been trying to get a boat out of the, the canal for three years and I can't get it out. But so maybe algae's a little easier to, easier to get out. Yeah. I have a meeting with uh, uh, the administrator uh, Scott Hopes on uh, Thursday. Uh, so if that is something that you guys would ask like him that to ask him to said the city said we expect them to do that. I will. I will do that. <laughs> Yeah, it's a, that's a really good support. So it's yeah, a good no. message, and maybe you don't do it everywhere, but maybe in some places where it's easy to get to, like the marina, it's not a, it's not going to be that hard to get to. But definitely try to quantify what you've done, weight or acreage. Either yeah, one. It's collecting back into the canals or into people's docks, mm -hmm. and, and they're the ones taking pictures and sending it to me and say, "Is there a way to clean it up?" And somebody even had a relative that did it on the west coast and said, "They do it. Yeah. Why don't we do it?" Well, we don't have that. We just heard the problems. We don't have really the authority to do it. Yeah, uh, and uh, DP now has contract mechanisms that will allow you to do that. To do it. Oh. That's something to look into. Thank you. I do have one question. You had mentioned about earlier um, our neighbors to the south may have not have done as good a job with some of their wastewater and over the years and that. And I know there's some issues still going on, but and they're looking at possibly 20 to 30 years before some of that can be fixed. And... Uh, I just wanted to, to give kudos to our previous councils and mayors that have 20 plus years ago done some good things that now are showing those fruits of positiveness and hopefully Sarasota is taking it as serious as they need to now. Yeah, the city has got uh, a treatment plant that is, you know, fantastic, just like your city plant is. Uh, Sarasota County used to have four of those AWT plants, now they have none. And uh, they went through that with a process. And you don't have to have an EWT plant to, to not have an impact on a bay, but you have to be a lot more careful because there's a lot more nutrients in it. And um, <clears throat> they are supposedly going to get the Bee Ridge plant to AWT by 2025 is what they said they're going to shoot for. Uh, they are already doing some of the good things, but for five to seven years, they had discharges around 750 million gallons of non-AWT water that came in, and it set that system back about 30 years. So what you do with wastewater really matters, and you guys are doing a good job. If you weren't doing a good job, the kind of phenomena that we're seeing right now would be not, uh, it would be a lot more common. All right, any Excuse further me. questions? Yes, ma'am. Uh, Dr. Tomasco, if, if you have the time, if you could stay, I know that we have a citizen here that's going to give comment dealing with the horses in Sarasota, or uh, I'm sorry, Pomasola. Um, if you could stay and listen to that sure. comment, I would appreciate it. No worries. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very much for your time. Down, so. Appreciate it. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right. At this time, we're going to call for citizen comments, which will be accepted on non-agenda items. Comments will be accepted on the public hearing and agenda items at the appropriate time. When you come forward, um, please state your name, and you'll have three minutes. We've got two cards here for a Marcia. Is it Weichel? Very good. Thank you. Come forward, please. Thank you for being here. Thank you. I'm Marcia Weichel. I live off of 59th Street in West Bradenton. Um, remember back when restaurants were trying to accommodate smokers by having a smoking section? often in the back of the restaurant? Remember when smokers were confined to the back of the airplane? Nobody was fooled. We all walked through a smoky haze to our seats. Confining horses to one section of Palmasola Bay is just like that. It's kind of like having a peeing section in the pool. That got a laugh at the very the <laughs> commission. <laughs> We have two nationally recognized estuary programs in our little section of the Gulf Coast, and their two main goals are to improve water quality and increase seagrasses. Manatee County has helped work toward that goal with a push in years past to get more homes on city sewer and to let Damon Moore and his RIP squad create more and more oyster beds. Here's an opportunity to do even more. Ban horses from Palmasola Bay. There is no hunting for the source of pollution here. The information in the packets that Tom has distributed to you more than amply describes how horse manure and urine is toxic to sea life and downright dangerous to humans. We call ourselves an agricultural county. No responsible farmer allows his livestock free access to flowing water. Years of educational campaigns by the Agricultural Extension Service have taught all of us the damage to surface water when livestock tramples banks 
and defecates in the water. Horses are clearly a point source for pollution. I happen to be the Manatee County Coordinator for the Florida Wildlife Commission Horseshoe Crab Surveys. You probably didn't know that we did those, and I will see about putting together a report to send you. The causeway has been reported the entire time the state has been collecting citizen reports as a nesting site for horseshoe crabs, a species that's possibly millions of years old. We survey the section of the beach next to the boat ramp, but get reports from beachgoers about horseshoe crabs along the north side of the causeway as well. A few weeks ago, we captured a female with an indent on her shell just the size of a hoof print. Horses aren't sea life, and they aren't compatible with sea life. Until the 1950s, you had to take a ferry to get to Anna Maria Island, and Palmasola Bay was one big bay. Once the causeway was built, there were only two ways for water to flush in and out of the bay. One is the bridge between the two halves of the bay, and the other is the, what used to be a small inlet into Robinson Preserve and was widened in the course of their recent um, updates in order to increase the water flow. Now that the channel has been widened, the horse manure has a chance to flush right into Robinson Preserve. Take that, all you kayakers. A recent issue of the Bradenton Herald had a huge headline, Manatees are starving to death, but Florida doesn't seem to care. Manatees rely on seagrass. Seagrass needs clean water to thrive. It's time for Manatee County to care and ban horses for good. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we have Tom, is it Scalota? Thank you. Mayor Brown, council members, uh, my name's Tom Scalota and I live at 7524 3rd Avenue, West Bradenton. Since I last spoke to you about the problem of horseback riding in Palmasola Bay, the county commission pushed the issue back to the city. Although they recognize the damage the horses are doing to the environment and the dangers to public health and safety, they preferred to not take action. Unfortunately, there seems to be considerable political pressure to continue this activity. As I stated in the email that I recently sent to you, they are choosing to support these two businesses while ignoring the neg negative impact on the thousands of people who fish in this area. They're ignoring the businesses of commercial watermen, charter boat captains, and tour boat operators. Most of our tourist activity is related to a clean and safe environment. This is being ignored. Just this morning, I, I checked, and there are 16 tour boat operators and 22, at least 22 charter boat uh, operators in this area. Another recent development is the independent water testing by Suncoast water keepers. Shows extremely high levels of E. coli when the horses are present. I presented you this morning with a graph from a sample taken on May 25th, 20, uh, 2021. The E. coli rate was 816, well above the maximum level of 70. And E. coli is only one of the pathogens that can be present in horse manure. Families with small children swimming in this area every weekend were vulnerable to a severe health problem. The other recent new development is the number of dead manatees that have been recovered in that section of the bay only. I also gave you an email from a group, environmental group called Save the Manatee. The second paragraph states, based on Cl Florida Wild Wildlife Commission synoptic and carcass recovery data, we are aware that manatees can be found in Palmasola Bay. We're also aware that Palmasola Bay is recognized as impaired for bacteria due to high levels of chloroform bacteria. The pushback from those who support the horseback riding in the bay is strong. When Pinellas County voted to ban the horses there, they got over 800 emails from supporters. Over 80% of those were non-residents who were recruited by the stable owners. I know this is a popular tourist attraction, that's why it's such a big problem. The volume of the activity is now causing so much damage it can't be ignored. That's the reason it keeps coming up. I'm asking you to take action and ban the horses now. It won't be a popular decision with some, but it's the right decision. Thank, Thank you. you.
Thank you. Um, Mrs. Beauchamp. Next, we have the consent agenda. We're asking for approval of items A through F. Mr. Roth. Uh, yeah, Mr. Mayor, um, I'd like to pull uh, item A off just for uh, clarification discussion. Okay, sure. All right, so you have a motion to approve motion B to through approve F? B, B through F, yes. Okay, so have a motion. Do we have a second on a motion? Second. All right. Um, any further discussion? Hearing none, we'll start the vote in Ward 1. Yes. 2? Yes. 3? Yes. 4? Yes. 5? Yes. Okay, motion carries five to zero, Mr. Roth. Yeah, okay, um, so I don't have any issue with this uh, purchase or uh, the price or anything like that, it seems. Um, but what I, what I was looking at, and, and I, I think it was mentioned before, uh, what, what I don't see on the, the information is what, what we're gonna do with it. Um, I know there's probably a, uh, a plan, but also, um, and I also know that uh, it's adjacent to another property that we purchased. So there's an assemblage, which I, I like the idea of that for, and then we're getting um, uh, auto uses off the street, but we should probably be able to say more what, what we intend to do with it. Uh, the, the hopes or initial hopes for that piece of property uh, as, a, as a potential site for the rebuild of some of the public works administrative facilities rather than the renovation, because the renovation has become extremely expensive. The hope was potentially look at that and build a building that wouldn't be a single purpose building that would only work for public works, that if it, somebody else actually wanted to be there, it could be used for a commercial business on that, on that street. So that's the intent um, to, to look at those. It's a ways away. Uh, the beauty of this is, like you said, it's getting rid of the former automotive uses and it is contiguous to another piece we have. So between the two now, we're at almost an acre and a half. And if in the future, I think it, it would be a nice opportunity. We don't want to get people out of their homes, but the two, there's two homes behind that that would rectangular, rectangle that off, would be a nice acquisition and would be a large uh, assemblage. When you look at the uh, master plans around LECOM, around the potentials of things that could happen over there, uh, ninth is a, is a key component to that, to link ninth to the Village of the Arts, whether it's residential, businesses, but anything other than the, the uses we know have been there, which have, have stymied that, so. Okay. And it was a good price, uh, the $360,000, the, the, the buyer um, uh, bought it a couple of years before for 300000 since demoed the building. So his actual uh, profit in this is probably fairly marginal, and we felt very reasonable at the, at the price that we offered on it. So he demoed the building? Yes, mm -hmm. he demoed the building. Uh, okay, yeah, because it's, um, it's an empty okay. lot. Yeah, that's the yeah, nice I, part about it. It's an empty lot now. Yeah. Okay. So it benefits us. All right. Well, that purchase. Yeah. yeah, and that's, I just wanted the explanation yeah, no, that's for, a good, that was for the very record. Good. For right. the record. And like you said, I think there was a question from someone about the price. I think it's, yeah. when you look at the overall, yeah. it's a great purchase, yeah. especially now. Yeah. So. All right, so. Uh, so I, I do move to uh, approve uh, item A for the acquisition right. of property, 1416 9th Street West. All right. Second, Second by Mrs. Barnaby. Oh. Uh, Mrs. Coker. Oh, Mrs. Coker. I'm sorry. I heard down that way. Um, all right. So we have a motion and a second to approve item A. Um, any further discussion? Start to vote in Ward 2? Yes. 3? Yes. 4? Yes. 5? Yes. And 1? Yes. Thank you. All right. Moving on. I guess we, Mrs. Bochamp. Next, we have the second reading and public hearing of Ordinance 3080. An ordinance of the City of Bradenton, Florida, amending Chapter 50, Article 2, Division 3, to amend requirements regarding placement of the special parking permit, to add a new section prohibiting parking in certain parking spaces and parking lots within the city without a special parking permit, providing for codification, providing for severability, and providing for an effective date. Um, again, we spoke about this briefly last time. This adds some clarifying language to our parking ordinance uh, that makes it a violation to park without a permit in a parking space designated as requiring a parking permit. Um, this is a public hearing, and we will be asking a vote on this today. All right. Mr. Rudisell, any comments before we go to the public hearing? No, uh, okay. unless there are any questions from the council. All right. All right. We'll open the public hearing. Anyone to wish to speak? 
Anyone wish to speak? Anyone wish to speak? Seeing none, we'll close the public hearing. The chair will entertain a motion. I move to approve ordinance 3080 uh, for amending the requirements regarding placement of special parking permit. All right. Uh, and second by Mrs. Coachman. Any f discussion? Hearing none, we'll start the vote in Ward 3. Yes. Four. Yes. Five. Yes. One. Yes. Two. Yes. Thank you. Five to zero carries. All right, Mrs. Beauchamp. We have no new business to bring forward today, and under unfinished business, we have the administrator, city clerk, and treasurer discussion. Okay. All right, and um, I asked for this to be on. I think everyone, we had gone through and got your uh, city administrator semifinalist from Colin. Um, just kind of wanted to go over and kind of see what the pleasure of the council was to... Uh, to discuss that and when we did talked about the one person who has withdrawn um, so any comments questions ways moving forward obviously we had talked about on the 21st and 22nd of June if we were able to come up with like a couple of candidates to bring in and that's something we have to discuss also um, if you look at most of them are from out of town so we would have to figure out travel plans and that uh, Mr. Roth? Yeah, I, I went through the packet and uh, I did like um, the two called Section 7 and Section 8. Mm -hmm. uh, and for the record, uh, Section 7, if you look at his experiences out of town, but he's been in, uh, he's just across the, the Skyway right now. So um, mm -hmm. it's actually commuting distance. All right. Any other comments? or? Who was the second one? He said number seven and eight on your eight. It's uh, seven and eight. Robert Perry and Leonard Sassamon. <laughs> so I mean, is it the pleasure of the council maybe to, to kind of come up with the top two and bring them in that's, in those two days that, and figure those a schedule? Two, those were the two that interest me. Okay. I, so, Mrs. Coke. I would say those were the my t top two as well. All right. Uh, yeah, I agree with the. Uh, uh, the section seven, Rob Perry. I haven't really looked that much at the second one, but number one, yes, was my top choice. All right. Yeah, my, he would be my heavy, right. heavy top. All right. right. And so, do we want to kind of go through a process and maybe um, have? I don't know if we just want to say it, or do we want to send it in, email, you know, one, one and two? Or? I think it's important yeah. to have yeah. at least two yeah. candidates yeah. interviewed by the council. Yeah. Yeah. At least right. two. At least two, yeah. right. So, mm -hmm. so, so, I mean, is that something that, right. again, right? Because we could lose looking one through those, I like, I like, right. I mean, I, I think it was a good pool overall. Yes. You know, yes. overall, it was a great pool. And I think those two were probably the ones that I saw had the most experience. Mm -hmm. uh, and steady, steady, um, right. steady records. Well, I'd make a motion to have those two chosen and for interview. Do we only want to do two, or do we want to do three? Oh. In case, a, in case one, one of yeah. you, if you if you didn't have a strong third, then I wouldn't. I I, I'd help, I'd amend it to, to the third if somebody wishes to. I didn't. I, I'm just I'm just asking in case. I, I don't care. I, I'll amend it if, you, if somebody wants a third. I think you can always come back. I, I mean, I think if you find out between now and then that there's they're not available for interview, the two. then certainly you could come back and find a third. I think. Okay. I think two makes it a little bit more consistent and okay. shows them that we're interested in those yeah. two, mm -hmm. and hopefully we're hitting it. We got it a week ago. We're having the interview process coming in right now. Yep. Let's move forward, and then those two will be a little bit more confident. And, hopefully, and you that say that's gonna, June 20 for June 21st. Yeah, 20th. Monday and Tuesday. We're going to see what days work the best. And what Colin suggested that we do is we have a group interview as a as a, a council, and then go through and have about 30 minutes individual with them. Um, so if we did something in the morning with one and the afternoon with the other, or if we wanted to make it over at two, again, travel plans and where they're, obviously one's closer, so it's a little easier. Yeah. Um, and then um, the, obviously we'll pay for their travel plans to get here in that if, if we, you know, show how interested. So. Well, I'll right. second Mr. Okay. 
Council so Sandler. bring in the to Rob Perry and Leonard Sossaman to yeah. interview on the 21st, 22nd. That's moved. A motion and a second by Ms. Coker. Yeah. Any further discussion? All right. Hearing none, we'll start the vote in Ward 4. Yes. 5. Yes. 1. Yes. 2. Yes. 3. Uh, yes. Yes. Okay. All right. And then um, just some further discussion on that. Um, as you guys had tasked me in the past to maybe check on um, reaching out to the FGFOA to see kind of if there was some in a transition period out there. Um, after researching things and that, I made several phone calls. I got one phone call back. So their name was on a list, mm -hmm. but three of them didn't return a phone call. Okay. So I thought that was kind of interesting. Yes. That, um, but the one lady that did is very nice and very capable. I'm also looking at a person here locally um, that is kind of semi-retired that does similar things. Um, the problem or the question is at this point is July, August or vacation time. So everybody's got stuff kind of going on. But looking through it, I believe with our current staff um, in place and with help, um, I believe that we, through the mayor's office and keep things going forward, we can manage through the process. I'm very confident. You know, I, um, we've got a couple of obviously losing key people in Carl and Sharon and, and um, possibly others, but um, working through with, with some of the staff in place, I'm confident that we can make things happen. And, um, you know, I will take that responsibility of, of working with it with the staff and, and also then reaching out to our department heads as we yeah. go forward. So um, if that's the pleasure of the council, I think, you know, I, I, at this point I don't, I feel confident we can do it. So. Yeah. I, I did have a lengthy conversation with our clerk and treasurer about uh, an option that where we could do it internally, possibly to limp through a little while. If we, if we can move this pro hiring process quickly, which we, we seem to be doing right now. We, yeah, and my, my biggest concern through the whole thing was is making sure we don't miss deadlines, trim yes. notices, yes. things of that. Right. And um, after discussion I had this morning, I'm very confident that we can, I, I, we can work through that. And, and again, it all comes down to you know, we, we've got to make sure we're doing the right things. And, and we've got great department heads working the budgets. Carl and Sharon have done a great job so far getting us a month ahead after our budget workshop yesterday. We saw that and very yes. moving forward. So And, and the yeah. comment that was made to me was having someone that could sign checks. Right, uh, and which, 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 which I, I'm comfortable with the which, suggestion that yeah, I made. Yeah, so we've got that all in the process and we're working forward with that. So, um, and, and again, I think we have a great staff and we're working forward on that and we can we can make things transition as smooth as possible we're going to have some hiccups but yeah. we'll work through those hiccups sure. as we go and uh, this was january it'd be a different time because it's not right. budget time but, but we're where we are so <clears throat> um and then as we go forward get the new administrator i think it's going to be important to work with that administrator figuring out our org chart mm -hmm. what they think is the most important direction to go for our city um, I don't have any more comments on that, if there's any questions. All right, we'll move on. Uh, council reports, we'll start in Ward 1. Oh, I don't have any. <laughs> okay, Ward 2. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, Mr. McClellan, can you give us an update, just so we can get the information out there, uh, with regards to the road work with Riverview Boulevard and also the road work at Oxford Drive and 30th Street? Sure. Um, well, technically, the, the work on Riverview Boulevard is our crews are out um, video taping the gravity sewer that is in that area. This is ahead of a waterline project that will be happening later this fall. Um, so there is a 24-inch gravity sewer that runs down, unfortunately, the middle of Riverview Boulevard. And so we are in the process of cleaning and cameraing in that. And so we've set up um, signs at the city limits and at 26th Street to indicate um, the road closures are ahead and we're doing kind of a, a rolling one block at a time road closure with detours set up for people so uh, we are trying to complete all of the work uh, before the 28th of June uh, hopefully we'll we'll beat that schedule but it's kind of dependent upon how much crap we find in the pipeline <laughs> so um, everybody's a comedian these days we try 
Um, as far as uh, Oxford, <laughs> oh, yeah, I will be here all week and next <laughs> and the week after that. Um, Oxford Drive, uh, it is a water main project and storm drain project that is just starting up. It uh, kicked off on Monday. Um, last week, in coordination with Jeannie Roberts, we sent out a code red notice to the uh, impacted residents in the area to let them know that it was coming. Um, the first stage of the project is the water line replacement project, and that will uh, encompass simply lane closures, and all residents will be uh, provided with complete access to their properties, um, but there will be lane closures. Once the water line project is done, there is some storm drainage work that will be done, and one of the intersections will actually be closed for a period of time, uh, and we've given them a, a limit of 30 days that they could keep it closed. So once we have uh, a better understanding from the contractor as to when that closure period will come, we will update the code red to those notices uh, out to those residents in that area. And uh, by the way, that is going to be our protocol moving forward too, is that we will be utilizing the code red for our construction projects um, that impact neighborhoods to let them know about those things coming. I think that's a great idea. Um, with Riverview Boulevard, there's always going to be detours around it, but we have a lot of people out in the county that travel that way on, in, you know, rush hour going to work sort of thing. While we're doing this, it might be easier for them to come down Riverview and then take 43rd to Manatee and stay on Manatee Avenue than, rather than trying to figure out the way that we have to go through the neighborhood. So that's why I wanted to bring that up, um, particularly since I know we have a lot of people that either walk children in strollers or walk their dogs around there, and they're not used to that level of traffic. Well, my, uh, my camera truck personnel have already indicated to me that putting up the detour signs and the road closure signs is about 50% effective in terms of people <laughs> who just continue to just blow through. Mm -hmm. um, so it's... Uh, it's amazing it's a work in progress. that great big piece of equipment. Um, thank you, Mr. McClone. Uh, I would also like to offer my condolences to the family of Norma Yates. Those of us that uh, grew up here in Bradenton and went to Manatee High School remember um, her husband, who was the coach and dean at Manatee High. Um, but uh, Norma has now joined him and uh, their daughter, Diana. And... Uh, Condolences to Leslie Yates. Thank you, Mr. Roth. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. Um, next time you all see me, I will have crossed a bridge to the year uh, 64, um, <laughs> which the reason, I, I wouldn't bring this up, but I remember as a young boy um, listening to old Beatle records of the song, you they know. They weren't that old. I, the way they, 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 were, they were before my time as a teenager, but, um, and I, I, it was a cute song about a, a an older couple, you know, will you still need me will you still, when I'm 64? Little did I know that that would be me one day, and, and yes, I am still in love with my wife. Um, uh, and, and she's I'll, still going to feed you. And, and she still is going to feed me. Um, and uh, on top of that, too, uh, uh, the last time I was up in the attic, I saw an old uh, campaign a photo of my very first uh, campaign in 2005. And what the heck happened to that young man? I have no idea. <laughs> Not that long ago. <laughs> You don't anyway. look that different. Well, so. in, in yeah. my eyes. <laughs> anyway, thank you very much thank for the indulgence. Happy birthday. Mr. Thank, Sanders. You. thank you. Uh, yes, I, would, I, would, I should have brought this up earlier and pulled the minutes from May 19, Council Workshop. Uh, I, I'm going to ask permission if you will amend those minutes to include that May 19th is Bradenton's birthday. In, in 1903, we were incorporated uh, on May 19th, and it, the vote was, I forgot, 54-39 or something like that. So that we didn't have very many people, uh, but that's 118 years, and maybe we should recognize that every year uh, for our city. To amend you know, the minutes? To I, would, I would like to amend the minutes to say that it's uh, Bradenton's birthday so that we every year we can, can do that. Well, you can I th add a I note. think you just reflect that in it. That's easy, I think, to add that. that we'll reflect that in it, that it is uh, the 118th birthday or what that number of, of the year, since, it, since it's kind of hard to retro do that. But I think to, to note that in the minutes is very acceptable. 
Okay. Yeah. So it'll be added to it. Uh, and, and at yesterday's workshop, we discussed um, uh, premium pay for uh, our officers, uh, fire department, and public works. And I would suggest that uh, each department or the county department begin to make a list of who that is so that we can be in and maybe in your and I, I think you already started that process okay. the way you, and so so that that can be prioritized because we know that that's something we're going to do let's let's get it done and and and, and you can do it with either through accounting and let their department heads approve it or vice versa or both yeah what we had done is we'd looked at it as getting the list that we felt like were eligible before we saw any of the rules mm -hmm. and then uh, some of the rules will throw a few folks out you know um, from that especially uh, what was presented yesterday is a more not in the workshop but in in documentation is a little more detailed as to who is eligible for that and who may not be so um, yeah we'll get that list together and then notify the departments that these are people that could be then it will be up to you to decide on amounts so the county department will get the lit prepare the list give it to each department head and say verify you know if you have any problems with this uh, well what will Ms. Bojan. What I might add is there will be a question that comes up. Does the employee that receives such a benefit have to have worked here from March when the pandemic started through current? And what do you do for the people that joined us in April or May? And Jim and I discussed mm -hmm. briefly, perhaps we want to look at a prorated amount for those people who were only here for part of the time. So it's there's more to it than just coming up with a list and saying yes or no. Those yeah, are yeah, I understand that, and that's details that you that department heads and, and yourselves can work out, and also to to well, make it uh, easier that that we're not talking about funding um, uh, FRS and that kind of stuff. Just simple, uh, you know, this is what we're going to pay, and, and just the federal tax and FICA tax. Right there, and those are details as well. Like Carl yeah, said, those are details, are, but make it simple as possible. So it doesn't become a complicated, complicated formula, unless it's mandated by. The, we will try to keep it simple. The feds will probably try to make it complicated. Oh well. Even though they say everything they're going to do is trying to make it as easy as possible. Right. Yeah. Right. right. And the biggest thing though is going to come down to the council deciding on the amount. <coughs> if it's one, two, or three thousand. Well, dollars. once we get, if you bring that back to us, once we, we get a head I, count, it's easier. I think we so. should, and because that way it's well documented that we've researched that this is what it is and, it, and it's always uh, uh, verifiable by um, you know records that we have on that right. so I, I, the rules are still changing like Carl said we right. received additional rules yesterday so I you know we would hesitate to do something quickly yeah. on it without knowing what but, what kind of protocol we have to fire right. file as far as the Department of Treasury is concerned I, I think the big issue which which I think is very important though is um, for for mr. Sanders and for all of us is this is a budget item as well so we're mm -hmm. trying to figure out is it a four hundred thousand mm -hmm. is it a half a, is it two million well, I mean incrementally if we know the numbers of people then you can assign a value whether it's a thousand two thousand you start knowing what your responsibility will be and, and makes it easier until we know the numbers the legitimate amount of numbers it's hard to figure that out so that's mm -hmm. so I, I think we can we've got a, a good start on that I think we can get that pretty well developed um, want to make sure with the department heads that they uh, understand the rules completely because there's gonna be some people who are upset who don't get it right. so right. it can't it's gonna have to be explained right by the department directors as well when they're talking to their people as to who's eligible who's absolutely not. so Okay. Absolutely. And that's going to be a key component as well. R right. Okay. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> since we have more time than we've ever had, um, I'll tell a little story that three or four weeks ago I, at church, uh, the message was that, you know, over your lifespan, you've probably hurt some people, said some wrong things to your family and friends, and that you should apologize. <laughs> I thought, that's not a problem. That's, you know. Uh, the next week, the message was... You should apologize to your spouse, ex-spouse, mm -hmm. girlfriend, significant other. And I said, oh my God, Pastor, do you realize what you're asking? So yes, yes, I understand, you'll be okay. With his hand on my shoulder, and I thought, boy, I don't know if I, he says, well, come back next week, you'll like that one. So the next week, and she's laughing, so next week, uh, he said, uh, I'm asking you that you have to apologize to all your enemies. 
And not only that, you have to pray for them. So whether you're, whichever category you're in today, uh, friend, foe, or whatever, I apologize and make that uh, public record. <laughs> Thank you. Mrs. Coachman. Um, also, I would like to say condolences to Leslie Yates' family. Um, and also, on a sad note, I want to mention that um, in Ward 5, there was a devastating fire actually half a block down from me um, over a week ago. And this family had lived there for 21 years. Um, uh, a mother and a father that raised their kids there to adulthood. Um, and their oldest son was injured severely and passed away mm. a few days after that. Mm. And the young man was a friend of my son's. Mm. Mm. <clears throat> but um, if anyone would like to help that family, I, can, I have some information. And Chief, you may also uh, be a source um, to um, assist, to uh, help anyone who would like to assist. Um, but on a good note, <laughs> Uh, most of the churches and businesses are opening up full, you know, mask free, and it's pretty exciting. I mean, sometimes now when I walk in a building and I see someone smile, I go, you know, because you don't see it. You've been seeing their eyes smile at, at best, but now it's so great to see smiles. And uh, I've got to remember now to put on lipstick because, <laughs> 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 because, because my lips are exposed. A um, couple of things, there have been some um, celebrations or recognition or, or uh, commemorative events going on, and one that I'd like to um, bring forth is that it was 100 years ago that an, a massive massacre occurred in Tulsa, and it was uh, the burning of what's been considered the Black Wall Street. So it's sad to say, you know, that that ag actually happened, but it made me think about Bradenton also, because when I was a child, there was a, a black business district. And in fact, Ninth Avenue, the parts of Ninth Avenue that are named after uh, Dr. Martin Luther King, that's where that business district was. And um, though it wasn't a massacre, when they widened uh, Ninth Avenue, it did also tear down uh, the black business district in my uh, neighborhood. So it kind of made me think about that because I can remember it. I'm old enough, I can remember it. Um, also, there's going to be a celebration called Juneteenth. And for those who don't know about Juneteenth, it's. <laughs> It's uh, celebrating when uh, the slaves in a part of the country were late getting the news that they had been freed. And so they call it Juneteenth, and that's coming up also. I think um, there are a few celebrations um, scheduled, and if anyone's interested, I'll probably have it on my Facebook page or something. June 19th is the date. Yeah. Uh, also, sorry, I got a little emotional about talking about family um, I guess oh and I had a wonderful tour of Lincoln Village uh, yesterday and though this council is not the council that made that happen or made those decisions um, I, I a community is very thankful and when the um, ribbon cutting occurs in a few months I think September ish um, obviously, all of us, I hope, are there, but I'd also like to extend an invitation to those who were po on that council, if they're still here locally, to uh, be a part of that. You? I was on the council, so was the past. When it was original? What was original? Oh, well, it was love apartments? No. Yeah. Oh, see, that's what I, I'm talking about. I wasn't about. born then. That, that's what I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> but but Mr. Rolfe, were you on council when that discussion was going around and it was being approved to create yes to yeah. Create, yeah yeah okay. for, for the what's there built now yeah i was also yeah. oh okay yeah. all right okay yeah. well, okay 
Well, good. And then invite Mr. Bird and Mr. Gallo. I think we were discussing uh, yesterday. Was it was headed, about yeah. six or seven years ago yeah. that it all processed. Started. Seven. And Mr. Okay. Mr. Smith was on that original part of it, and then the oh, final yeah. approvals. You came out of here. Yeah. <laughs> Remember what your minister says. Yeah. Remember what your pastor says. All right, we got to start over. <laughs> yeah. and, and, and I'm assuming it was a unanimous 5-0 vote because if it was a no vote from somebody, they're not invited. No. <laughs> we're going to say it was, it was no until we're proven otherwise. <laughs> yes. um, and last, um, lastly, I'd like to say before the next council meeting, a very special day will be occurring, and that's Father's Day. So I'm going to extend a happy Father's Day to all the fathers. And I don't know if you remember when I talked about Mother's Day, that not all fathers are men. You know, uh, single moms have to take that job, grandmothers, grandfathers, uncles, aunts, all of that. So happy Father's Day to all of those people who provide that kind of nurturing. That's it. Thank you. Yeah, appreciate it. And I just want to send along condolences, obviously, to the Yates families, too. Coach Yates was one of my dad's favorite coaches at times in high school and through the things, and what he did for, for our community was great. And obviously, normally, there's a great woman behind a man in that. So um, she's going to be missed from the community standpoint. Um, and then also just um, commend our fire department, because over the last couple of weeks, we've had some very serious things that we don't see a lot in the city but you know they've done a great job and i think from the community standpoint they saw that and then obviously it's a tragedy whenever we have anything like that and somebody loses someone so that's that's um, just sad there and 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 you know reach out to all of our graduates now that are growing and learning and just say hey enjoy the summer but now that things are getting back more to normal um Welcome to Do the right things and welcome to the real world and going forward. So, um, all right, that's all I have. Uh, let's start with department heads. We'll start with Ms. Bochamp. Uh, just a quick reminder that we are going to be changing our city email addresses. I know Chris reached out in the newsletter and in a couple other ways. Um, everyone except the police department. Nothing's touching the police department, but the rest of us will be going from cityofbradenton.com to bradentonflorida.gov which offers us the cybersecurity help that we will be getting from the feds that, that make this change worthwhile. But know that your old email addresses will still continue to get your email to you just like normal. We are easing in the transition of the BradenFlorida.gov starting actually in my department is kind of a, a guinea pig for the process. So we don't, we don't need new business cards? No, the old ones will work. Until um, it rotates totally out. up to you. Okay. And it's, it's BradentonFL.com. Dot gov. Gov. So you've got to remember right. dot .gov, but FL. Yes, is Bradenton the, and FL. Right. <laughs> Bradenton and FL. Right. Okay, that's all I have. Gov, so. Okay. All right. Thank you, Robin. Uh, nothing to report. All right. Chief? Uh, nothing real. I do want to just add on to, to what was mentioned. Um, yeah, we've been busy. We've been slammed here in the last three weeks, but um, guys did a great job. Uh, that fire in particular, a lot of things went bad on that. Uh, prior to us getting there, there was obviously an explosion. And um, the way we're set up, when you get on scene, everybody has their job to do. And everybody it really, for the most part, did a great job. Uh, we had a uh, electric feed uh, burn through and drop on one of the, on one of the engines. And, um, you know, guys that obviously did their job and, and kept an eye out for it and um, kept somebody from getting killed, that's real dangerous. We had that happen to us quite a bit, you know, electric feeds will drop, fall on a chain link fence, you know, and just everybody's got to have their kind of head on a swivel, but uh, they did a real good job, and as bad as that, the outcome of that, it, it could have been a lot worse. So that's it. Uh, the, the explosion was an oxygen tank? Yeah. yeah. It was. All right, and while we're talking with the chief, I think it's a good time now to probably bring up about maybe doing the, starting the first steps of replacing the chief okay so i mean we're six months out and we want to start that process so we'll start bringing that forward okay all right, all right. thank you okay good all right chief um two things uh you know i always try to come with some feel-good stories i know i already had one this morning um and i don't know that that's what this is but i thought it was interesting stay tuned um i've been kind of curious about the skyway bridge i you know grew up 
um, in my law enforcement career having to go out and try to talk people down and, and what have you. Um, and I just three years ago had to stand out there um, on my way somewhere in my cruiser and talk somebody down. Um, so the fences have gone up. Uh, one of my officers was heading um, northbound, although he did tell us southbound, so that caused some problems, and um, encountered a potential jumper at the top of the Skyway day before yesterday. And um, it has a successful ending. So he, um, and I'm looking forward to viewing the, the body camera. So the, the gentleman was standing on top of his car and was very perplexed on how to get over the, the fence. Apparently it's a no climb fence. Um, Cause I've been kind of going slow and saying, are you sure nobody can climb that a bit? But apparently um, it worked. And I don't know if we're the first agency to encounter it since it's gone up. I try to keep tabs on what's going on in the Skyway, but I'll do, I'll do some further research on that. Uh, but he was on top of his car trying to figure out how to get the extra few feet and he was not successful. And my officer um, got there, it was a, a brand new one, he's still on probation, and was able to um, de-escalate and use some good negotiation and, and talk him down. And so, yet another life saved, at least for that day. Um, FHP came and, and greeted him. Uh, I'm not sure if you all know, a, a couple years ago, actually as a result of my experience, with the, the protocol for dispatch to the bridge was completely changed and it went away from jurisdictional um, segments because it's very parsed out. You know, there's three jurisdictions right. when it comes to the, the Skyway to closest unit, um, kind of more like a, a fire department type thing and, and, and heart largely dependent on what side of the bridge they're on. And uh, we found some success with that, although we called out the wrong side. Um, and I think that that has helped get, get officers there quicker. Uh, but I thought that was pretty interesting. I thought I'd share that with you. Um, it seemed to work. That's the first time that we all remember having somebody standing on the top of their car trying to figure out how to how to get over. Um, but it was definitely a, a disaster averted. So um, the only other thing I want to share, I'm not sure if you all know, and he doesn't know I'm going to say anything. So I'm sure you know I'll get a bad evaluation or something. Is the um, the mayor since he uh, became our mayor took it upon himself to start giving out birthday cards to all of our employees. And in those birthday cards, he, and I'm 99% sure it's out of his own pocket, includes a gift certificate to Turner Donuts. We kind of take that personally over at the uh, police department. <laughs> Maybe it's because we're a large part of his staff, um, but uh, the, the folks get these gift certificates. And if you think about how many employees are in the city, that adds up to, to quite a bit, and they can take it and um, use it, or you know, I don't think he has to pay if, if they don't, but I have a feeling a lot of people have been going to use it. And so I tell you that to say um, the mayor's birthday is this Friday, and uh, I have a little birthday card for you. We, uh, we like Mission Barbecue because they're a, a police-friendly like place, so, so you get a gift certificate to, to Mission Bar Barbecue for lunch, but... Um, so I wanted to just say happy birthday, but we all appreciate. You on Friday. <laughs> we we do all appreciate that what what you're doing, and um, it sometimes it's those extra things, and I I think that it's quite generous, and it is meaningful for for all of us. Well, I haven't gotten it yet, but I'm sure I will soon in a few months. Um, <laughs> Gotta be your birthday. <laughs> we do we do appreciate what you're doing, and and happy birthday, sir. Thank you, appreciate it. I also want to send along condolences to Jeremy Giddens' family who unexpectedly lost his father so um, you know it's a lot some of us have lost our fathers obviously and others still have them but uh, you know it's not something that is easy when you're going through it so we want to send along condolences to him and his family so and thank you sir and he was a fixture in the law enforcement yeah. community he uh, retired from Palmetto Police Department and then also retired from Holmes Beach Police Department and so it is a, a loss to the law enforcement community thank you Jim I uh, just want to give an update on some of the construction that's going on as well as construction that will be starting soon. Um, obviously we had a, uh, a, a replacement of a sewer pipe out here at the intersection of 3rd. We waited until school was out to uh, minimize the 
the pain. Mm -hmm. uh, that should be paved by the end of this meeting, I would hope, and uh, things will be reopened. But uh, as part of the last DOT project, when they upgraded the intersection at 3rd and 9th, uh, their, their subcontractor installing new signalization wire drilled through the top of one of our sewer pipes. Uh, we found it as part of our inspection process. There was no dip in the road or anything, but there would have been. And so we took the proactive approach to, re to replace it once we found it. So uh, that's what that was all about. Uh, we have two projects that both will be starting after the 4th of July weekend. Um, uh, both are force main replacement projects, uh, replacing some 1954 era pipelines, again, proactively before something happens. Um, so uh, we continue to look towards uh, improving our infrastructure where we think we may have problems rather than where we have a problem. Um, also, what's that? Where are those? Uh, one is for um, the, the force main from lift station 10, which is the one that is on Manatee Avenue, right across from Champ's office. Okay, as part of the Manatee Avenue project improvements that were done back in 2012, we replaced the portion of that force main that runs in Manatee Avenue. Um, this project is going to pick up where that left off and go, it runs along 3rd Street from Manatee Avenue all the way to uh, just adjacent to the Major Adams uh, Historic Cemetery. Um, it is a directional drill, <coughs> so there'll be just two excavation points, one just south of Manatee Avenue on 3rd and one basically where the um, gravel roadway is uh, on off of 3rd. Um, adjacent to our water storage tanks and such over there. Um, so that will be one project. The other is associated with lift station 17, which is located next to uh, the other side of the cemetery. <laughs> so we're, we're kind of a attacking both sides of it. But um, on uh, 9th Avenue West, um, in the past we've replaced um, two pieces of that force main that have broken and caused problems. As part of those projects, we identified that there were potential future problems coming associated with that. So that's what this project is, is to replace that last piece of that, about 850 feet of that pipe. Um, so again, 1954-ish era pipeline to be, it's lived its life and uh, we thank it for all it's done, but it's time for it to go. Um, Work on the fire station is finally picking up. Uh, they've got the, d the decking on, so now we'll start to get into a uh, close-in on the building and be able to start the interior work associated with that. A um, little bit of a hiccup along the way, but we're, we're moving along on that. Um, lastly, uh, if you go over to uh, the construction associated with the Riverwalk project, uh, you'll see that um, they should be there's forming up of sidewalk that is going to go in front of the Shoreview Apartments. That area now you could walk from 10th Street Court East over to um, 14th Street along that area. Um, and the, so the, you'll see formwork in place associated with the sidewalk that's going to be formed over in there. Take the fence there? Uh, the gate's still there, but it's open during the day when they're working in that area. So. Um, and they'll be installing uh, work uh, associated with the, the bridges that are going to go across the bioswales in the, in the, uh, in the park. Uh, it's also quite interesting. Uh, we've been coordinating with the folks with uh, Reflections of Manatee associated with any of the ex excavation. Um, and if you go over there now, uh, on the south side of the project, they've collected um, a, a variety of uh, old bottles that they've found from uh, the excavation. Um, some that are eh, maybe 1960, but some are probably 1910, 1920 era. So, uh, but he's lined them up along the excavation yeah. and it, uh, it's, he's having a grand old time digging through the piles of sand that we have over there. Um, and lastly, I just point out that uh, last evening um, we had a meeting with the skateboarding community at our skate park. Um, got some good feedback about some things that uh, associated with trying to, one, improve the park, but also to improve security 
and improve um, the elimination of graffiti and the problems associated with it. Um, so I am give a shout out to the folks at Realize Bradenton who helped organize that for us. Um, but uh, myself and uh, BPD were there to represent the city and um, got some good information as well as the fact that there was, I, I, I'm sorry I don't remember the, the young man's name, but uh, there's a skateboarder from Bradenton who cut his chops at our skate park who is now on the U.S. Olympic skateboarding team that will be heading to Tokyo. And uh, he was there at the event from us last night. He actually had just flown in from Italy and uh, was a, a great attraction and was signing skateboards for some of the younger kids that were there. So it was a pretty interesting event. Wow. Cool. Yeah, awesome. All right. Mr. Callahan? Nothing to report. Mr. Rudisell? I don't have anything, Mr. Mayor. We are at the moment of being adjourned, but I'm going to allow former Councilman Reverend James T. Golden, current school board member, to come up in three minutes. Thank you, Your Honor. Yes, sir. Good morning to all of you, my former colleagues, coworkers, uh, to Ms. Coachman, the uh, representative from Ward 5. I'm here today um, on behalf of the Ward Temple African Methodist Episcopal Church that I had the privilege of being the pastor of for more than 20 years. Mm -hmm. And I'm here with my friend of longer than that. I have known Reverend Sykes uh, probably as long as I've been in ministry. And I'm here on behalf of his member, your colleague now, uh, Mrs. Uh, Pamela Coachman. And I'm here because I want to be clear that Ward Temple, as it was on the my jurisdiction and under his jurisdiction operates within the confines of the laws of the African Methodist Episcopal Church. And I have been informed that there have been people who have been coming before you representing themselves to represent Ward Temple. I'm an attorney. I represent Ward Temple. And if I don't speak for Ward Temple and the pastor doesn't speak for Ward Temple, nobody does. Nobody. And I really do not want to have any interruption of the relationship that we've enjoyed for 30 years here uh, since I've been in this community by having someone represent to you something that we do not approve of and probably aren't even aware of. Now, I can specify the particular incident that brought me here. I don't think I have to, but I can assure you that I know every member, every member of War Temple AME Church and every member that has joined since this pastor has been there. And some of the people that have come before you representing themselves to be members or speaking on behalf of War Temple AME Church, they don't have that power. Mm -hmm. And if you have any doubt about how that is or what it, what, what, what it, what it means, talk to your uh, colleague now, uh, Councilman uh, Coachman, whom I was very, very pleased to support in her effort to join you uh, on this council. Preach. <laughs> I didn't bring the offering plate, Ms. Barty. Yeah. But, so, <laughs> but uh, we, we, I can give you the address at, uh, of Ward Temple. And I know Ms. Barnaby, been, I don't want to tell them about how we met the first time. Ooh. But uh, uh, she was well, one of the. She says it that way. It makes it sound so salacious, and it wasn't. <laughs> Well, all I will say is I was in my bathrobe. And oh! <laughs> I was going door to door. Yes, you were. Oh, it gets better. As yeah. I was campaigning in my first campaign. Yes, yes, you were. Well, oh, well, there goes that. So, But um, in, in all seriousness, we take our church very seriously. And we don't want to be misused or manipulated by anybody for any sectarian purposes. We are about saving souls, have been always. And uh, I just uh, commend uh, my colleague. Uh, we've now had two city council persons to come out of Ward Temple AME Church. And uh, we, we thank God for, for that. And I thank you for your being courteous in allowing me to 
uh, to speak. I'm at the Florida School Board Association convention in Tampa, and I had we had a meeting earlier this morning. I had to drive back uh, to get Reverend Sykes uh, to come with. I don't know whether Reverend Sykes has had the pleasure of ever uh, yes, coming yeah. before you all yeah. <laughs> for yeah. any issue, uh, but um, we've we've known each other for thirty some years. And Reverend Sykes and I have had a few conversations and met at the church a couple times. Yes, sir. That, that, and that, that's fine. But nobody other than this pastor and, speaks and we, for I think we understand that and we see that, so we're working forward. And, and Reverend Sykes has my cell number and I have his cell number. So. And, and, and thank you for informing us of this because we didn't know that. Have you informed the individual? as well oh yes okay <laughs> <laughs> oh yes okay, okay. Yeah. thank you all right reverend golden did, were you baking earlier this morning was i baking, baking. <laughs> He's looking. i just don't remember all the of pot, this up here on your hair. Oh. i thought you got oh. did, were you baking and you got <laughs> chief <laughs> how do i complain about public <laughs> insult <laughs> is that a misdemeanor or a felony? I just need to know. Now, Reverend no. Golden, you and I, I since know. I have seen you in your bathrobe, <laughs> have a very good relationship. Yeah. No, I, um, I, I got all this after I left the city council and <laughs> <laughs> it started oh, serving. The school it board did that to you. School. Okay. I'm the vice chair there now, so. That's, that's and in charge of public comment. Uh, yes. <laughs> I'm going to go now. <laughs> is anybody else? Is the coachman, did you want to say anything? I mean. <laughs> yes, I do. I would like to thank you for clarifying that. And it's absolutely uh, an honor to even have you in chambers as I sit here in chambers. Cham chambers um, and Pastor Sykes, I miss you. I'll see you. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Reverend right. Golden. Thank you. You all have a good day. You too. Yep. May, I'm sorry. May I be excused? Yes, yes. sir. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> all right. Anything for the good of the whole? We'll be adjourned. All right. Thank you.